This is recorded, um, which um, works to your advantage if you should happen to miss a day, or if you want to go back and review the material. Um, it is not quite the same as being here because you can't ask questions and sometimes some of the code's a little hard to read. But at least it'll go to give you an idea of, of what's going on. I will ask you though to make every effort to be here as it, it, it is sort of not normal for our division to run classes that are this small. So um, I, I, I want to show that their faith in us by choosing to run this class was well deserved. Uh, the mobile program is pretty new, so because of that, we want to make sure that, you know, we, we work through it. We'll work through all the classes, and it'll give you a chance to spread the word of mouth on some of these classes to people so that hopefully we can get the enrollment up in future terms. Um, you've both had me before, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in fact, earlier today, you did. <laughs> uh, yeah, right, right, right. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so, so I, I probably won't take quite as long a time on the class introduction as I normally do, uh, but I, I still want to hit uh, the high points of the syllabus and, and, and so on before we get into the actual material uh, of the class. Let me take attendance before I forget. Should be fairly straightforward to take attendance. Linda is here, and you're Je uh, Jeffrey, right? Okay. Um, that's weird. All right, and I'm here. Okay. Uh, let's go uh, on Angel and look at um, some of the high points of the material there. I kind of expect you to uh, look at some of the stuff on your own. Um, but I, I do want to hit the high points. Um, let's see. S start looking at, actually we'll come back to the syllabus. Copyright, fair use in education. If you've had me in any of the classes before I talk about this, this relates to what it is legal to use um, in, within an educational context. Um, there's different copyright laws if you're doing something just for school as opposed to do if you're doing something in the real world. And they're less restrictive, which is good. So, um, the main point of this is to not use too much from any given source and to give proper credit to the source. Uh, you can read the details in here. I will post the videos for the lectures and any example files in the lectures folder. Your assignments will be in the assignments folder. Uh, discussion forum will be a place for you to ask questions between classes. The Opera Mobile Emulator, that's one thing that you probably want to download and install on your machine. Um, we do have, um, we do have um, devi mobile devices available for you to test on, all right? But prior to doing that, or if you're doing it at home and you don't have a mobile device uh, to test on, uh, using the, the uh, Opera mobile emulator, it, it can be very effective because you can configure it and you can run it. You can see what your web page looks like under different scenarios. So uh, again, essentially what it does is it emulates different mobile devices. And we'll see examples of this, but this would be something I would download. Later on in the course, we will look at installing a web develop environment. Uh, in this class, we do... Um, some stuff in HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And there was a smattering of PHP in there. Not a lot, but a, a little bit of PHP in there. Um, and in order to do that, you need, uh, you, you need a web server running. So 
this is probably the simplest, most painless way I found of, of installing a web server if you don't have one already installed in PHP. All right, so we'll cover the syllabus. Towards the end of the class, we'll come back to the assignment, first assignment. And in between, we'll do sort of an overview uh, of the class. Uh, syllabus. Again, just hitting the high points. On the top of the syllabus is, whoa, on top of the syllabus is different ways to contact me. The thing about that, again, is if you're having difficulty with material in the class, please make an effort, effort to contact me. Uh, there's several ways that you can do it. Probably the uh, most popular way, you know, if you're having trouble with something, you can certainly ask questions in class. Um, if you don't understand something, being a small class, you can get a little more individual attention than you could in, in a larger class. So if you have a question, ask it by all means. Um, if I don't think for whatever reason that the, the lecture time is the time to address your question, maybe it's related to a, a something specific to a problem that you're working on, for example, a homework assignment that you're having problems with, I might tell you that we'll review it in lab instead. All right, so lab is another time that you can get your questions addressed. All right. Um, other places you can get your questions addressed will be during office hours. Uh, I will publish my office hours prior to next week. Uh, they, they're not effective until next week. Um, but you could come and see me during those. Another option is to come during one of my other lab sessions. Uh, you are invited and people in my other classes are also invited to come in and attend any of the lab sessions that I run. All right, so even if it isn't for this class, you can come in and you can sit in and on the lab and get extra attention. I make that deal with every one of my classes, and it's good because normally, you know, most people work pretty independently in lab, and, and therefore I have a lot of extra time that I could spend an answering other students' questions. So by all means, um, that's another way, and I can give you the, the information on those if, if you think that is going to be needed. So the wild card and all, well, you can also send email, either through Angel or through my regular email account. You can call me on the phone. It's better to send email than call me on the phone, though, uh, because I, I typically uh, answer my email more frequently than I answer uh, the voicemail. But the wild card here is if everything else fails, just talk to me and we'll figure something else out. All right. Um, don't let the fact that, well, I can't fit in this time or that time in my schedule keep you from asking the questions. We'll figure out something. Um, my aim is to be as flexible as possible. Read through the descriptions of this. The instructor approach. Again, you sort of drive the show here. Um, your understanding of the material is more important than me covering the material. Uh, sometimes instructors joke, you know, did you cover such and such? It's like, yeah, well, I covered it. I don't know if students understood it or not, all right? And we shouldn't have that as being the case, right? You know, it's not really covered unless it really clicks with you. So if we have to slow down and cover something over again or go over more examples, then by all means, we'll do that, all right? And that's sort of my belief in any class, and that's even magnified more in a smaller class such as this. All right, we can really take our time to make sure that you understand it. Um, covering every page of the book is less important to me than what we do cover, we cover thoroughly and you really understand. All right, I'd rather have you understand, you know, six things really well than 12 things really sketchy. All right. I would ask you to check Angel between classes. I use that to communicate. Um, I use that to communicate for several things. First of all, any announcements. If I was going to be missing a class, I would post it via, uh, via Angel. Um, if there are questions that happen in class that I don't have an answer for, oftentimes I'll do research and post the answer to Angel. You know, because again, you know, you're allowed to ask me questions I don't know. Or I try something and it doesn't work. And we all know how that is. You can stare at something for an hour and not be able to see the answer. And once you step away from it and take a look, the answer jumps out at you. So 
You know, I'm not embarrassed to say that that happens to me sometime teaching, and therefore what I will do is I will take it home, look at it, and then when I do have an answer, post to it. And any other things I might post announcements for. Uh, on occasion, students will ask questions like, uh, you know, uh, I don't understand what you mean by this lab assignment. Well, I'll post an announcement that will explain it if I think it will help other people as well. So do check. In addition, when your homeworks uh, start rolling in and I start grading them, um, I'm a, a big believer in uh, having you rework your assignments if it's not correct. So therefore, uh, check your email to see if I've graded your assignment, if you've gotten full credit. If you haven't gotten full credit, uh, rework it. And in either case, read my comments. Sometimes you get full credit, but I still have something to say about it uh, that, that I think is relevant. So plan on checking that a few times in the week. Here's a bunch of college policies. Instructor policy concerning late work. Um, the main point is, is I can be flexible as far as late assignments provided you work with me. What do I mean by work with me? I mean, if you're having trouble with something, let me know you're having trouble with something and ask the questions. Um, if there is something going on, you know, on a personal level where you need to be out of town or you need to miss a class or two and that's causing you problems, you don't have to give me personal details of, of what the situation is, but just let me know that something's going on and you plan to have the material completed by such and such time. All right? I'm a lot more uh, open as far as giving credit uh, for late assignments when, when I'm engaged with a student in that way. Um, so I reserve the right to deduct, but I also reserve the right not to deduct. You know, I would rather you take a, a day to really get your thoughts together and turn in something a day late that's, that's really good than to rush to turn just anything in and just to be able to say that you made the deadline. So let's focus uh, not just on the timeliness of it, but on the, on the quality of it. And again, what sort of goes along with that is I like to give the opportunity to re rework assignments, redo assignments if they're not, not up to snuff. That being said, if you find yourself continually uh, being behind in, uh, in your work, then it's probably the time that we need to talk and, and figure out uh, a plan to get you back on track. It's going to be three quizzes, 14 weekly assignments, some of these assignments might be combined into larger assignments. So you might have you know, one assignment that spans two weeks or three weeks instead of 14 individual ones. And then there's a final exam. And here's the schedule. It's best if you read the material prior to coming to class. Uh, my sort of philosophy as far as the book and lectures um, is that I don't think it does me any good to read the book to you or to cover everything exactly in the book. Uh, I consider my lectures and the book as two different resources that you have uh, available for you. And my hope is that both of them together are better than one or the other would be by themselves. So I don't aim to duplicate what's in the book. Uh, I aim to give my slant over the same material and bring in examples and so on. So it's valuable to read the book. It's also valuable to hear my lectures. Any questions about any of that kind of stuff? All right. Onward and upward. And for a certain point, today's discussion is going to resemble very closely the discussion that we had in the earlier class. Because what I want to do is I want to start off and I want to paint a picture of what mobile software development is like. All right. Um, there's a, an intro to Android class that Melinda is, is enrolled in, and, and therefore we started that class. Pardon me? Oh, you are as well? Yeah, he's the guy in the class. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I did not, did not, did not remember that. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry about that. Wow. I, I've... Yeah, right, 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 exactly. So yeah, I feel dumb now. Uh, well, that was not, that, well. No, I'm glad you pointed it out, and I didn't go all day saying that. You know, as so, uh, that's why. Again, I asked you if you have any of my classes. It's like, yeah, you know, six hours ago, I had. Uh, that was early. That barely counted. All right. Uh, at any rate, it will be a repeat. But again, for the benefit of the person that isn't here. Uh, you know, they can watch the the video and all that. But I probably won't go in quite as much depth, knowing that two of you. Uh, have heard that. Um, 
you essentially have a choice between two paths. And the, 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 the punchline of all this is, is you're likely to do several of these things to really cover all bases. Uh, in general, you have apps and you have web apps. We'll call these native apps. This is a specific solution. This is a solution written for a specific platform. This is a general solution, which is a solution written with standards in mind. And as long as a device complies to that standard, um, it, in theory it should work. Now, what that means in the case of web is as long as it follows the HTTP standard and, and has a web browser, which is a pretty minimal restriction. Just about everything these days has a web browser in it. So therefore, um, web apps should work in a variety of platforms. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we know that in practice, um, that's often not the case. In practice, there are browser compatibility issues and all that that sort of chip away at that, um, at that goal of being able to develop uh, an application that works in, in all different platforms. Um, this can be optimized for a given platform. That's one advantage. It can be optimized to work on the iPhone and take advantage of all the features of an iPhone. A web application typically can't. This you typically will need multiple versions. This in theory you may only have one version but there's some pretty big catches here. All right? And really a good part of today's discussion is going to be talking about those catches. But in theory you could have a web page and maybe with a small enough site it would be possible that the desktop version was identical to the version if you accessed it from a mobile browser. All right. Now we know that in practice there's some things that throw a monkey wrench into that. The physical size of the screen, the way that you interact with the mobile device. But in theory you could have a site that you could pull up in one uh, on a desktop and, and have it uh, and pull up the same web page identical web page in a mobile app. And again, for maybe for some smaller apps or, or some smaller websites that would be practical. Now, I mentioned the, the, the punchline sort of is that an organization will typically do a mix of these things, all right, when they consider their web presence. You may have, for example, a mobile website. You may also have then a mobile application, at least for certain platforms. One of the big things that, that can be done is the bi two big platforms are Android and Apple, iOS, that neglects things such as a Windows phone or Blackberry or so on. Whereas those will have a browser, so you might write a native app for these two platforms and folks on other platforms can simply use the browser to access your mobile website. So that's often done. Companies also want to sort of hedge their bets, you know. You, you don't know where people's uh, preferences lie. Uh, as far as accessing some content via the web or accessing it through an app. All right. An app typically can provide a very focused, well-defined experience for the user. But again, some people are web people and they like the ability to connect and, and interact on the web in that way. All right. Now, we kind of went over this before and again, Given, given that both of you here today uh, you know, had that class, I'm not going to spend tons of time uh, repeating it. Um, if, if the third person has additional questions uh, about this, they, they can ask me. So we'll move on from this. Now, when we talk about developing web pages, we're not going to talk about apps anymore in this class. All right?
or not to any great degree. But we are going to start talking about websites and web pages. We alluded to this earlier today again, but to reiterate, the two big difference between accessing the web on a mobile device and accessing the web on a desktop is number one physical differences. The screen is smaller. You touch the screen as opposed to, you know, navigating a mouse. You may have an on-screen keyboard instead of a physical keyboard, and so on. And the physical differences are a big deal. All right. Um, we looked at um, LC's, or, or one of the students looked at LC's mobile site versus their desktop site, and the, the mobile site is much simpler, much pared down. All right, which makes sense. It makes sense actually from both perspectives. The one perspective being the physical limitations of the mobile screen. The mobile screen is smaller so you can fit less stuff in it. Could you imagine what it would look like to try to view LC's full-blown site on a little tiny mobile screen? That would be horrible. It's not all that much fun viewing it on a desktop browser, to be, to be frank. It's very busy, very busy site, a lot going on there. But could you imagine trying to navigate and work your way around through that on a, uh, on a mobile screen. So one of the implications of this is that the layouts on a mobile device tend to be simpler. All right? One column instead of multiple columns, for example. <clears throat> the second difference between working in a mobile environment, working in a desktop, or laptop environment, is the goals of what you have. There's a different usage, different sort of usage. You know, if you're planning what degree program that you want to major in here, if you, let's say you were first coming to LC, you would likely not do that through the mobile application. All right, you'd likely sit down with your desktop machine and navigate through, look at the options, and come to some decisions. That's sort of a longer, more deliberate process involves going back and forth between web pages, maybe Googling some things on the side, you know, gee, exactly what is a, you know, a, a network administrator do? Okay, I'm going to go and look that up, and so on. Whereas Mobile, mobile web pages, I don't know, users using mobile web pages tend to be very focused on what they want to do. They're not responding to some sort of open-end exploration. They have a specific question that they want answered. Is the campus closed today because it's too cold? All right. Um, I need to call Zellers to tell them I'm not going to be in class tonight. What's his phone number? All right. Um, Gee, where is the Spitzer Center? I've never been there before and there is a meeting there that I have to get to. So what's the campus map look like? All these things are very quick, immediate answer sort of things. So with mobile devices, there's a, there's a sense that you're using the website while you're doing something else. All right. If you think about sitting down, you sit down and you surf the web. Right? That's what you're engaged in for the most part. With mobile devices, you're doing something else. You're driving to school and you want to check to see if the campus is closed. Or you're walking around campus and you want to find the Spitzer building. All right, all those things you're doing along with it. So it's sort of, um, again, a different sort of usage. Um, to use a mobile device for that. So, again, we'll find mobile devices having pages that tend to be simpler. A desktop application, a desktop website rather, may try to address everyone's needs, all of everyone's needs. Or a mobile application, a mobile website might try to address just the needs of people, um, the typical person is going to be accessing via a mobile and answer the, the, the typical sorts of questions that, that, that they would be asking as their moving around and, and doing things. All right. There is, there are three sort of strategies that you can do 
as far as accommodating your desktop and mobile users. All right. And it'll be obvious which one we're not going to spend hardly any time on. All right. Here's the three things you can do. Nothing. That's number one. Guess what? We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Why? Well, because there's not really much to talk about when we're talking about nothing. All right. Two. Whoops. We can have one page or one set of pages that get different CSS applied depending on the platform the user is using. All right. Now, I'm sure both of you have had the intro to web development and one of the things that we talked about and we stressed in that class was separating the presentation from the or separating the appearance from the content of a website. It was our goal to be able to take any content on our website and arrange it any way we want to and get the appearance to work any way we want to. All right? So we, we developed things in a very specific way and we had anything doing, dealing with the appearance we had in our CSS file. And the content was in our HTML file. This is one of the big reasons that we do that. All right? My goal is to do as little as possible and get a website that works both in a desktop and in a mobile environment. Doing nothing is almost too good to be true. Right? It's going to be very rare that a website can be used as is both on a desktop and on a mobile device. Let me rephrase that. Not that it can be used, that it provides for a good experience. You, know, you, can, you can navigate to a website. You can navigate to LC's website or, or any website on a mobile device. But it's not going to be necessarily a, a, a good experience for you. All right? So nothing, that's not going to be too often. Not often can we get away with this. So therefore, what we want to do is... Next to uh, doing nothing, the best bet is to keep one copy of the web pages, but just apply different style sheets, depending on the, um, the device that you're, that, you're, um, that you're talking about. All right? That works pretty nicely. Then you don't really have double work, right? You have work to set up the initial page, and then you have work to create each of the two style sheets. So you're not creating two, for every page you're not creating two HTML pages and two style sheets, you're creating one HTML page maybe with a couple different style sheets. So you're not really doubling your work there. All right? You're taking a page that's adaptive though, that can look at the, the, the conditions that it's being displayed in, look at its environment, and have itself displayed differently depending on the environment that, that it's in. The last one is simply having two copies of the site. In other words, have a desktop and a mobile version. All right. This would typically be the case when there's a big difference between what you want to show a, a mobile user versus what you want to show a desktop user. Let's try to, well, let me try to come up with an example of um, when we might use each of these approaches. If we had a page that simply had a banner, a row of links, and a content area like this, we might be able to get away with doing nothing. All right? Very simple page, maybe one thing I mentioned before is maybe like for a restaurant or something like that that has a limited number of selections. All right. We could make this 
be 100% of the screen, so it stretched across the whole screen. We could use the relative sizes of things and make this look reasonably good across different platforms. All right? You're kind of lucky if you can do that, though. You're not necessarily going to be able to do that in all cases. What you might do in a case like this is have a desktop site have a multiple column layout to accommodate the wider monitors that you typically get and have the mobile site have a single column layout. Well, we take the same things that are on the desktop site and simply display them differently. We don't have duplicate HTML pages. We don't have duplicate pages, but we have different CSS that gets applied in both environments. So we're able to take that HTML page and display it different ways. The last option is to redirect people depending on how they visit the site to either a desktop or a mobile version of the site. So for example, if I were to go to lorraineccc.edu using a desktop browser, it displays this. And notice the URL up in the address bar. It says lorraineccc.edu. Can you imagine what that would look like on a mobile device? It would be really hard to deal with and really hard to do anything with. If I still have some battery power here, let's see what it would look like on a mobile device then. All right. So if I and I open up my browser and I go to lorraineccc.edu. Notice what happens. Page looks totally different. It has only a subset of the links. And the one thing that you can't really see on here, but actually the URL is even different. It redirected me to lorraineccc.edu slash m. So there's a different URL for the mobile website than there is for the actual website. Let's see if I can, I should be able to pull up the mobile version here. Now it redirects me back. When you have two sites like this, essentially the web server has a traffic cop. All right? And the web server evaluates each request coming in and decides, are you a mobile device or not? If you're a mobile device, it sends you to the mobile version of the page. If you're not, it sends you to the desktop version. All right? So, in essence, these are our three choices. We can have a one-size-fits-all page where we develop one page that is responsive and resizes itself based on the screen size and so on and so forth. We can create responsive pages all right, that do more as far as the appearance go and apply different styles depending on whether uh, you're on a desktop or on a uh, mobile device. You might, for example, have a background image on a desktop version of a web page, but have no background image on a mobile because that would sort of clutter up the appearance of it. And then finally, you can have um, two totally different versions of the site. All right? That technique we will save to later on in the term. We'll talk about redirecting to two different websites later on in the term. The first thing that we're going to talk about, though, as far as developing these web pages, it works for sort of these two scenarios. And 
We're going to even use some of those same techniques when we get into this, even though we're redirecting them. All right? And that is to create pages that are responsive or adaptive. When we talk about responsive or, or adaptive, really, we're not just talking about mobile websites. We're talking about adapting your page to its environment, which means that as a screen gets bigger or smaller, your page is going to change its size. Aspects of the page are going to change their size. All right? There's sort of a three ingredients in this recipe. All right? One of them is to have fluid layouts. Remember from way back in the web development class, we talked about three basic kinds of layouts, sort of the fixed or the ice layout, where everything was defined on a pixel basis. That this, this thing started in pixel 100 and was 600 pixels wide and so on. We are not going to use that technique with responsive sites. With responsive, it's all going to be relative and it's all going to be fluid things. So sizes of things are going to be based on percentages uh, to a large degree. All right. So we'll use a lot of floating in this. We're not going to you know, say this is in this position, position absolute. We're going to do a lot of floating of the elements on our page. So fluid layouts, number one. Number two, fluid images and other media. In other words, we're not going to say a picture is set to be 400 pixels wide. We might say that that image is 80% of the space that's available for it. All right. In that way, we don't try to display a big old giant picture that goes off the edge of a, of a phone screen. We resize the image to fit neatly uh, within the screen that you have. These two things are really just an extension of stuff that you probably learned in CISS 216. All right. The third piece that we'll, we'll spend some time on um, is what are called CSS3 media queries. And what CSS3 media queries are, are the ability to specify different style sheets in different environments. All right. So we can build rules into our style sheets that say if the screen width is less than 480 pixels, use this style sheet. If the screen width is greater than a certain amount, use this style sheet. So we can do that without any coding, without any JavaScript or PHP or, or any other sort of coding. And again, those are known as CSS media queries. All right. I'd like to play around a little bit with some of these ideas. Let's see what we have on this machine here. Let's look at this. These are examples I used last semester, I think, in CISS 216. All right. Let's say this is our web page. Notice that it's a three column layout. All right. 
Notice what happens as I go to resize it. Absolutely nothing. All right. Is that a good layout for a mobile device? Absolutely not. All right. It's not responsive. It's not adaptive. It's probably workable in a laptop or a desktop environment, but it's probably not even that great of a layout for that. Because again, if someone has a big gigantic monitor, it's going to take up a tiny portion of the screen and so on. So there's nothing in here that is relative. All right? Everything is absolute. Let's copy these and we will we'll try to um, make this a little more um, work out a little bit better. So let's go and let's copy this and let's make this responsive. Here we are. Now, notice with this that there's actually three, actually, I'm sorry, two style sheets. And there's this little snippet of code. This style sheet and this little snippet of code are in there solely for old browsers. Okay, let me explain to you what these are. This example we're using, we're creating an HTML5 document. All right, notice we're using a header tag. There is no header tag in previous versions of HTML. That's an HTML5 element. Uh, the nav tag, there is no nav tag in previous versions of HTML. That's an HTML5 element. And so on down the line. So, in browsers that can handle HTML5, those will handle it just fine and dandy. However, let me remove these lines of code and try to view this in Internet Explorer. Notice how it doesn't work there. All right. Why doesn't it work? Because this version of Internet Explorer doesn't know HTML5. All right. So, what can we do to get that to work? Oops. We can put this line of code in. What does this line of code do? It looks to see if we're running a version of Internet Explorer prior to IE9, and if we are, it's including a little JavaScript file. All right. And that JavaScript file makes some necessary adjustments to make this work um, in previous versions of Internet Explorer. So now if we go and view this in Internet Explorer, now that we put that code back in, get the, we get our security warning, we allow it, and it's back to looking the way that it should be. So, this line of code here simply allows my HTML5 document to be displayed correctly in earlier versions of Internet Explorer. Now, this is a key concept, and we're going to come back to that, all right? Because there's other things that we, we need to do sometimes to handle uh, shortcomings in Internet Explorer prior to version uh, 9, Internet Explorer 8 and earlier. All right, there's a number of, of other issues with that. And we're going to use the same kind of logic here to address those issues like we used in this case. So um, remember this because we'll, we'll add to that. Now the other line of code that we had in here 
was simply code that does the same thing for Firefox, for earlier versions of Firefox. Let me look to see what version of Firefox we have here. If we even have Firefox installed. And we don't. Not that I can see unless I'm overlooking it. Well, just as well. This line of code does a similar thing for Firefox. All right? It adds a CSS file that essentially tells file fi Firefox to treat the new HTML elements like block elements, which is what it needs to do. All right? And so now we have this page that should work in everything but ancient versions of Firefox and Internet Explorer and any recent versions it should work fine um, and we should be in good shape. Kind of we should be in good shape. We're still running into the issue of the fact that these pages are um, not very responsive so as the, 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 the page changes sizes it doesn't change uh, that. So what can we do to fix that? Well, there's a number of things that we can do. And again, these things work whether you're talking about transitioning between desktop and mobile or just transitioning between different sides on a desktop browser. All right? So let's go and let's look at this responsive CSS and make some changes to it. First of all, I'm going to remove any reference to the width in absolute pixels. So I'm not going to say width of 880 pixels. I'm going to say width of 100%. If I wanted to go all the way across the screen, we'll say a width of 100%. Get rid of the absolute. And I'm going to float this to the left. This I'm going to make a width of, say, 20%. And I'm going to float it to the left as well. I'm also going to get rid of any of the absolute pixel positioning. So anything that relates to the width or the position that's hard-coded, we are going to get rid of it. And we're going to replace it with widths that are based on percentages. And I'm not exactly sure where we're at, so let's take a look at it and view this in the browser. Let me just give the code a once over. All right. We're actually pretty close to where we were before with a few, uh, few differences. All right, a few small differences. But notice that everything is sort of side by side. And notice that it's no longer fixed. So as I make things bigger or smaller, it gets bigger and smaller. But we also notice that there's a bit of a problem here, right? And that once we get so small, you know, if you imagine maybe this being the width of a, of a small mobile phone, that's really sort of hard to read. All right? 
So we're moving in the right direction. We're making it adaptive. We're making it so that when the, when the, the size of the page changes, when the size of the window changes, the layout changes as well. We're just not quite all the way there yet. All right. What we can do, though, is we can do something like this. And we can put some minimum widths on these elements. Now, minimum width, it's OK to have that as an absolute number. Because what we're going to say is, let's say for this, I'll make the minimum width Two hundred pixels. So I've given a width to be twenty percent of the size, and let's make it one hundred fifty pixels. But the minimum width that I'm specifying is one hundred fifty pixels. So I'll make it twenty percent of the available space. But if it gets smaller than a certain amount, it won't make that smaller than one hundred fifty pixels wide. All right, one hundred fifty is as, as narrow as it will make it. So that gives it sort of a little bit of wiggle room, but not so that it can collapse down to a tiny little thing that you can't read. All right. I'll do a similar thing here. Let's vary these up a little bit and save it. And look at it. All right. So now we start off looking like that. Whereas we have, again, if you remember, I made the banner 100%. I made the navigation 20% with a minimum width of 150 pixels. And I believe I made those two columns be 300 pixels with a, oh, I'm sorry, 30% with a minimum width of 300 pixels. So, Watch what happens. As we make this smaller, notice that this guy gets smaller. These don't really get any smaller because their minimum width is 300 pixels. So watch what happens when we reach a certain size. Boop. Goes down to there. And if we were going to look at this in a mobile device, it probably would end up looking like that. So we've gone effectively from three columns to one column just by tweaking some of the settings there. Getting rid of all the absolutes as far as size go. Getting rid of all the absolutes as far as um, widths go. And putting in instead floating elements and putting in relative sizes for it. But, <coughs> excuse me, still keeping a minimum amount being a fixed size so it doesn't collapse below a certain amount. So this is the start of what we call responsive techniques, right? Because we've ditched the, the, the absolute sizes of things and we've put in relative sizes instead. We've put in percentages and we're floating the elements. Now we could play around with this more and make it look a little better. Um, maybe we could make the minimum width on these guys something like... 200 pixels. So these guys shrink a little bit, but they won't shrink lower than 200 pixels. And if they do, boom, they go below. Boom, it goes below. So if you can imagine, again, this might be how the page looks like in a Desktop environment, find three columns. You have more space on a, on a page, therefore you can make a, a multiple column layout. And on a mobile device it might look like this. All right. Now again, you know, you could play with these numbers to do a better job than, than I did and get it. This, this isn't necessarily a, a top-notch layout, but I wanted to illustrate the points of using the combination of the minimum layout or the minimum width with the percentage width and the floating to get it to dynamically switch between uh, that. 
Now we have a page that's responsive. Now we have a page that it matters how big the window is. So without even coding anything, without even doing the media queries or anything else, all right, we're now in a position that this page will look different depending on the screen. All right. Let's see if we have the Opera uh, mobile browser installed here. I hope so. And no, we don't. Let me go and install that. Doesn't take long at all to install. Play with these numbers, hopefully get a There we go. I guess I can install it. <clears throat> I'll make sure that that gets installed uh, <clears throat> before future classes. The idea is it would look probably something close to this if we were viewing this on a mobile. And uh, the idea, again, is that you can go very easily from something that um, is a fixed layout to simply by putting in minimum lengths, or minimum widths, rather, and, and percentages for widths, you can make it respond to the different sizes. All right. Now to be sure, that is just a very simple, straightforward example, but those are the principles that you're going to want to have. In this class, you're not going to want to have any of your pages have a fixed width. All right. You're going to want to use relative widths. If you have a minimum width, that's fine, but you're not going to want to say the width is a certain number of pixels. Likewise, you're not going to want to do the same thing with images either. Let me find an image to put on this page.
All right, here we have a picture. And it's called Autumn. And it is, let's look at the dimensions here of it. It is 360 pixels wide. So let's go and let's put this image in one of our divs on our responsive page. I'll put it in the top of this div. And this image is 360 pixels wide. So, if I go and I bring this page up, notice what happens is it kind of cuts off the image. All right. And as I resize it, Let's change this to 200 to make it more dramatic. As I make it bigger or smaller, it cuts off more or less of that image. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to tie the width of that image to the width of its container. So how would I do that? I want to make that image as wide as the container that it's in. What would I set the, the width as? I set the width to 100% because I want that image to take up as much space as it can. So when you give a percentage, you're talking about the percentage of the container. So I want the image to be this wide. And if that div resizes, I want the image to be that wide. So what I'm going to do in my CSS, and I'll just do it for um, pound sign part one image, I'll do a width of, let's say, let's do 95%. Now notice that it's, the image is never going to be bigger than its container because I've sized it relative to the container, which means that as the screen gets smaller, that image gets smaller. But it doesn't get any smaller than the minimum width of that. All right. This is sort of two of the techniques for responsive development. And we'll go over examples of these. So don't worry if, if, if you're having a hard time understanding this. All right? But this is two of the big techniques for this. Number one, fluid grids. That's where we put the widths of everything based on a percentage. All right? The other thing that we did is we did fluid images and other media. So we didn't make that a certain number of pixels, we made it a certain percentage. All right? So that as the page gets bigger and smaller, that image gets bigger and smaller. So regardless of the device that it's viewed on, the image will 
stay within that and it won't get bigger and, and go out. These are two of the key techniques in responsive web development. Again, to remember uh, this or to review this, this is essential as far as developing in a mobile environment, right? Because in a mobile environment, one of the big differences that you have is you have different screen sizes. Well, different screen sizes really become a problem if you use absolute positions and if you use absolute widths. So one of the things that we do is we don't use absolute positions and absolute widths. Instead, we use relative positions and relative widths. All right? And just as we do it for that, for our grid and for our layout elements, we also do it for the images. So we uh, give widths to our images or sizes to our images based on percentages so that the image resizes as the window resizes. Questions about any of this? Let's take a look for a minute at your first homework assignment. I want you to go online and find some articles, some web pages that talk about responsive web design, what we sort of introduced today in class. I then want you to create a web page that explains the topic and also embodies those principles. So I want you to create a page about responsive web pages that itself is responsive. So that as you make the window bigger and smaller, the page expands and contracts based on the size of the window. Your page should be well designed, look professional and complete, and it should contain three links to different websites that are, that are available on the web that contain information about responsive web design. So for this first exercise, you're meant to create a responsive page all right, that um, contains information about responsive web design. So that's your first assignment. Questions about that? All right, that's all I had for today. We'll see you next week.